Good evening, everyone, and welcome to all who have joined us for the third in a series of webinars on the proposed K-12 education reform in Manitoba. Before we begin our webinar presentation this evening, however, I would like to recognize the distressing details announced by the Cowessess First Nation in Saskatchewan today, revealing the finding of 751 unmarked graves at the former cemetery near the Maryville Residential School. Children from southeastern Saskatchewan and southwestern Manitoba were sent to this school. Please pause with me in a moment of silence to honour all those who lost their lives. Thank you. In this evening's presentation, we are considering research perspectives, conceptualization of communities, students, teachers, and learning. Our panel this evening will specifically address questions pertaining to three areas of focus. What are the conceptualizations of students, teachers, and learning that inform Bill 64? And what are their implications for particular groups of students, communities, and contexts? What existing research on students, teachers, and learning needs to be considered, and why? And finally, what should our priorities be, or what could we imagine as possibilities for education at this time. This evening, our invited speakers include Dr. Melanie Jansen, Associate Professor in the Department of Curriculum Teaching and Learning in the Faculty of Education at the University of Manitoba. Dr. Mark Cooley, Assistant Professor in the Faculty of Education at the University of Winnipeg. And Dr. Candy Skyhar, Assist, Associate Professor in the Department of Curriculum and Pedagogy at Brandon University. And I am your host, Dr. Leslie Edley Trudell, and I'm the Associate Dean in the Faculty of Education at the University of Winnipeg. It is my honor to facilitate this webinar this evening, which is supported technologically and logistically by Tamara Gillum, Confidential Assistant to the Dean in the Faculty of Education at the University of Manitoba. This past week marked the 25th anniversary of National Indigenous Peoples Day, celebrating the rich heritage, diverse cultures, and outstanding achievement of First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Although we celebrate on these days, we acknowledge that as a country, we have yet very far to go. This evening, we will begin by acknowledging that the host and panelists are located in Treaty 1 and 2 territories, and the lands on which we gather are the original territories of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Assiniboine, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis. And the photo in this slide 
was taken in Treaty 1, just north of Winnipeg, in a field beside the Red River. Land acknowledgements are part of who we are. They are a mixture of our past, present and future. They are celebrations of Indigenous communities and important steps in our journey to acknowledge truth, sometimes difficult and disturbing truth. And then we must engage in reconciliation. As a result of this acknowledgement, I would like us to think of how we will leave the land a stronger and more empowered place as a result of the information that is being shared this evening. As we consider questions this evening about our communities, students, teachers, and about learning, we note the importance of cultivating strong relationships and nuanced understandings. And we find essential the need to continue to establish an evidence-based foundation upon which we have the conversation about education reform. On that note, it is my honor to introduce our esteemed speakers for this evening's webinar. I'm going to begin by sharing with you the titles and bios of our presenters. First, we have Dr. Melanie Jansen, who will be speaking with you about constructions of the student in Bill 64, erasures of difference. Dr. Jansen is an associate professor in the Department of Curriculum, Teaching and Learning at the University of Manitoba. And her areas of research are in curriculum studies and teacher education. She uses critical perspectives to explore the interrelated workings of power and discourses, particularly as they relate to the identities of teachers and children. Before joining the faculty, Melanie was a teacher for 15 years in Winnipeg. We have Dr. Mark Cooley, who will be speaking to us about who do you think we are? The assumptions about the identities of teachers, students, and the purpose of schools behind Bill 64. Dr. Cooley is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at the University of Winnipeg. He also coordinates the service learning program, which engages pre-service teachers in tutoring placements within underserved Winnipeg communities. Mark came to his job after 15 years of working in Winnipeg public schools, and his recent research involved listening to the stories of Indigenous youth tell about their time in school. He has an enduring, if beleaguered, belief in the promise of public schools to renew society in spite of it all. Dr. Candy Skyhar will be speaking to us about conceptualizations of mathematics achievement and rural communities in Bill 64. Dr. Skyhar is currently an associate professor in the Faculty of Education, Department of Curriculum and Pedagogy at Brandon University. Her research interests include rural education and capacity building, teacher professional development, mathematics education, and teacher identity. Prior to moving to Brandon University in 2015, Dr. Skyhar spent 20 years as a secondary educator in three different rural Manitoba communities. She is both passionate about the strength and beauty of rural spaces and a staunch advocate for those who live and work within them. Each of our presenters are prepared to speak for approximately 20 minutes and each presentation will move from one to the next without interruption. Although your mics and video are muted in this webinar, please feel free to place any questions that you have in the Q&A by clicking on the icon at the bottom of your screen. I will monitor the Q&A and I will draw from the questions that you pose, allowing the presenters the opportunity to respond to the uh, questions at the conclusion of the formal remarks. At this time, we will begin our first presentation. Please welcome Dr. Melanie Johnson. Thank you, Leslie. I hope you can hear me. 
if I could get maybe an indication in the chat that you can see my slides and hear me, that'd be awesome. Yeah, thanks. Great, Leslie. Thanks. Um, thanks, first of all, to Dr. Falkenberg, um, his committee of colleagues at the U of M and the U of W for organizing uh, this webinar series and for the invitation. Thanks also to Leslie, Mark, and Candy for being here tonight. Um, and thank you especially to our participants, the folks who are here in the audience. I can see many of your names in the chat, and I know many of you are teachers. Um, who frankly must be exhausted by now with the incredible year that we've had and with all of the end of year events that are happening right now. So I appreciate everyone's attendance tonight for your interest in finding out more about this bill and most of all, for your commitment to public education. In acknowledging the discovery of the 70, 751 unmarked graves near the Kausas First Nation at today and the 215 unmarked graves announced last week, and the untold number of graves yet to come, I want to draw a line between policy and our current reality. That is, the residential schools, the graves, the ongoing colonial and systemic racism are the effects and outcomes of legislation. As former TRC Commissioner Murray Sinclair explains, as children in residential schools were learning that they were inferior, non-Indigenous children were learning they were superior, that the settlers saved and civilized Indigenous peoples. In addition, school curriculum was void of the teaching about Canadian genocidal policies, including the forced removal of children to residential schools, day schools, and industrial schools. This is in part why legislation matters. Legislation and the subsequent policies and curriculum become the narratives that we tell, enact, and come to believe. We need to do better. To get started, I want to spend just one minute on the context so as to orient you and my presentation focus tonight. As you likely know, the Education Review follows other neoliberal and conservative reforms from across the country. The Education Review Commission was struck in 2019, the consultations ensued, and the commissioners provided their report to government in the spring of 2020. After a small interruption called COVID-19, the government released the commissioner's report and their response, which was named the Better Education Starts Today and the accompanying legislation, Bill 64. Although the education minister, Cliff Cullen, refers to the best report often, and even though it is highly problematic in its own right, the analysis that I'm sharing tonight is focused only on Bill 64, since that is what is tabled to become the legislation. There are endless numbers of critiques to be made about Bill 64, some of which my colleagues in previous webinars have already talked about. There's also been widespread criticism from the Manitoba Teacher Society, the Manitoba School, Manitoba School Boards Association, Manitoba Association of Parent Councils. Various municipalities have been passing resolutions, um, local school boards, First Nations and researchers and so on. These critiques have focused on the proposed restructuring of the education system, which includes the abolition of school boards, not a restructuring, an abolition of school boards and the locally elected trustees, and the subsequent creation of an appointed provincial authority board. There are also criticisms about the lack of democratic and local decision making, centralized and partisan control over programming, finances and teachers, the undermining of the teacher unions and of local collective bargaining, structural racism, and more. I urge you to find out more about any of these that you haven't yet heard about and other issues. You can check out many of these uh, organizations' websites. They've done a fantastic job of providing information for the public. Um, as well, feel free to contact myself or um, I'm going to just invite you to also contact the other panelists if you wish to choose so. Before I dig into the analysis, I want to articulate the functions of education as described by Gert Biesta. The first function of education is to provide students with particular knowledge, skills, and dispositions. Some might call curriculum, broadly speaking. The second function, and I should say these are in no particular order, but, but function inter, interchangeably um, and, and uh, collaboratively. The second function of schools is to teach kids how to be with others in our particular communities and society. What does it mean to learn about, work with, engage with, and understand the differences of others? And how do children learn to understand, negotiate, and value, value these relationships? The third is to learn how, in relation to knowledge and relationship with others, do students become subjects in their own rights? In other words, who does the student get to be and become? 
Education then is not just about how we can get the world into our children and students. It is also, and perhaps first of all, about how we can help our children and students to engage with and thus come into the world. I'll come back to these ideas later. What my analysis reveals and what I will demonstrate tonight is that through the use of language, intention and silences in Bill 64, the student is constructed as compliant and in needing of control as a homogenous group and the subsequent approach to education is a standardized one size fits all approach that fails to reflect the functions of education. Compliance. Although the preamble of Bill 64 states that parents and students are encouraged to be active partners in the student's education, there are no indications after that statement in the 370 plus pages of the bill of students being given any active role or partnership in their education. The bill plainly states, reminiscent of what you might see posted in the school hallway in the 1950s, that students will attend punctually and ready to learn that they will behave, comply, and contribute to the school community, although there is no mention of what that contribution might look like. The student is devoid of rights except for the right to attend school, mentioned one time in the pre preamble, but that right is contingent and in a constant state of being revoked throughout the bill with persistent references that threaten suspension and expulsion of students. Whereas the student's right is mentioned one time, suspension and expulsion are mentioned at least 12 and 16 times respectively, not including in headings or references to teachers, which is another conversation. The rights of parents are broader, yet also fail in their aim to be the active partner that was encouraged in the preamble. The rights of parents are stated as entitled to be informed about attendance, behavior, and academic achievement to consult with a teacher about academic achieve achievement, to have access to students' files, to be informed of discipline and behavior policies, and importantly, to accompany the child to the board when an expulsion decision is being made. In addition, there are numerous policies that the bill authorizes the Provincial Education Authority Board to develop. Remember, the Provincial Authority Board is largely um, appointees by the minister. These policies are all related to controlling the student and include student promotion, which is in regards to passing and failing policies, students at risk, what to do with those disinterested students, discipline and behavior management policies, and suspension and expulsion policies. The bill seems to assume that students are constantly on the verge of defiance. By contrast, there are no policies that are to be developed about, say, anti-racism, reconciliation, decolonization, children's rights and rights of Indigenous people, equity, eco-justice, just to name a few. While the student is not allowed to meaning, oops, sorry about that. While the student is not allowed to meaningfully participate and the parent has a right to be informed and consulted about academic and behavioral issues, the principal school community councils, provincial advisory councils, regional director and provincial education authority are to be informed of students' achievements and learning outcomes so that these outcomes can be monitored, analyzed, evaluated, and shared. In other words, all assessment data on students is collected, reported up the chain, and monitored, again, by largely non-elected and government appointed officials most of whom are not necessarily educators or educational experts. All of this, a system that minimizes meaningful engagement, that seeks compliance and control through behavior management policies, and that privileges quantifiable and standardized data as a way to track students, is an oppressive form of surveillance that actively detracts from meaningful teaching and learning. This kind of surveillance re reinforces compliance to a pre-established norm and in determining who is conforming to that norm, conversely also determines who is abnormal. This kind of surveillance, what Michel Foucault would call a panopticon, is a means of exercising power. It seeks out, pathologizes, and punishes difference or defiance. This surveillance is also enacted on teachers and principals as well, but again, a topic for another time. The teachers and researchers here in this group will know that this approach to education, one built on compliance and control through surveillance, counters decades-long research about the importance of student agency, engagement, 
relationships, ethics of care, meaningful assessment, and so on. Students as homogenous. Within Bill 64, difference and diversity is not a central organizing concept, nor is it considered a source of strength within our society. Indeed, it is barely acknowledged. And when it is, it is constructed as a deviation from the norm and something to be accommodated. That means to make adjustments so as to more cl closely align with the norm rather than adjusting the norm to be more inclusive. Case in point, diversity is identified in the preamble of the bill as something that needs to be respected within the learning environment. It is also noted in the section requiring the authority board to develop a respect for human diversity policy. However, this is actually a requirement of the Human Rights Code. The policy to de be developed according to the bill is required to include only two things. One, that, teacher and staff, that teachers and staff are trained about bullying, which is a grossly narrow lens for considering student misbehavior. And two, that schools are to, quote, accommodate the establishment of student groups that promote equity, such as um, GSAs or Gay Straight Alliances. In this structure, there is an othering of varying sexual orientations and gender identities left up to kids to advocate for, establish, and seek inclusion themselves. There is no mention of the diversity of students who attend schools in Manitoba, the multitude of languages that students come to school speaking. Urban school divisions have, for example, over 40 different languages that their families speak. There's no, di there's no discussion of students that, um, in, that vary in race, culture, ethnicity, religions, and family structures that students might be newcomers or refugees, or that they might be one of the 11,000 children in care. There's no mention of varying socioeconomic factors, the needs to address poverty, or that school would be a place where students with all of their differences would be a central tenant, indeed an organizing principle of our education system. Another example of this omission of diversity is in regards to inclusion of students with special needs. Whereas inclusion is stated as a fundamental element of a democratic society in the preamble, again, it's not mentioned anywhere else in the document. There is a section on appropriate educational programming. In our current Public Schools Act, however, appropriate educational programming takes up 12 pages. In Bill 64, it's reduced to one sentence that reads, the Provincial Education Authority must provide appropriate educational programming in every school in a regional catchment area. Problematically, however, Bill 64 shifts the responsibility of appropriate educational programming from the local school board and principals to the Provincial Education Authority. In a similar pattern, reconciliation is noted in the preamble, but then also does not appear in the, pre in the remainder of the bill. And more problematically, reconciliation, when it is described, is considered as a way to ensure the success of Indigenous students positioning Indigenous students as having a problem of success rather than a problem of opportunity caused by the ongoing colonialism and systemic racism. Reconciliation should be an orienting principle within education for all students, teachers, staff, and communities, a concept that should be recognized, as Sheila Cope Meek describes, as an active and meaningful process built on relationships. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action, specifically numbers 62 and 63, call on provincial governments and ministers of education to work with Indigenous people to create curriculum and resources about residential schools, treaties, and Indigenous people's historic and contemporary contributions to Canada. All of this is absent in the bill. Oops, sorry. The bill is constructed around an assumed homogeneity of students. It lacks any meaningful acknowledgement of the diversity of our communities. It ignores linguistic, racial, ethnic, religious, socioeconomic, gender, and ability differences, and minimizes and centralizes planning for students who are differently abled. Indigenous students are simplistically constructed as unsuccessful, air quotes, a problem to be addressed by lip service of reconciliation. Instead of positioning differences and diversity as the very fabric of our society and the reality of public school classrooms, Bill 64 constructs difference as a, as a deficiency and it's devalued. It's something to be accommodated, to make fit into an already established norm. Obviously, this counters research informed in educational practices 
and ethical orientations to education. Moreover, this homogenous assumption about students does not respect the fundamental principles of education in a social democracy, and that is that education must be for all people in society. Standardized schooling. So I've illustrated so far the ways in which students are constructed as needing to be compliant and controlled and considered to be a homogenous student body. I wanna now consider what this means for assumptions of schooling. Schooling in Bill 64 is considered to be about educational programming intended to achieve learning outcomes. As I mentioned earlier, achieving learning outcomes is referenced dozens of times throughout the bill and those outcomes are to be reported, analyzed, monitored and evaluated. Given the absence of attention to equity, diversity and inclusion, and given that the bill is organi organized around a homogenous student reflective of white Eurocentric colonial and patriarchal values, it seems implicit that the learning outcomes will be reflective of those same values. Schooling here then is a standard and standardized approach, privileging some while actively excluding others. Kids who are black, brown, or indigenous, who speak different languages, who have an ability difference, who are poor, who identify as LGBTQT, sorry, Q2, will be required to conform to a particular and prescribed way of being in order to achieve success. In other words, for many kids, success will, will mean obfuscating factors integral to their identity. Moreover, the focus on achievement of prescribed outcomes on the futurity of success measured in economic production reinforces neoliberal narratives of capitalism and globalization, which I'd love to expand on, um, but won't have time to do here. So, the failures of Bill 64 are endless, but let's go back to the functions of education that I, approved, uh, that I um, proposed at the outset of my talk to reflect on the bill in this context. In regards to qualification, there's definitely a focus on achieving outcomes in the bill, which arguably could be about content or skills, but given that what is being taught is what can be measured and monitored, means that the likelihood of this knowledge being critical or creative or learning in relation to and with others is unlikely. The perennial questions that we ask as curriculum scholars, what is taught, who decides, and to what end, are entirely absent in the bill. Curriculum teaching and learning in Bill 64 is constructed as a technocratic means end approach reflective of ne neoliberal values of individualism, productivity, and production. In regards to socialization, there is no sense in Bill 64 that education has a social function. The ways in which diversity is ignored does not bring children together in their being, but rather seemingly divides them and us probably further. Bill 64 is designed for a homogenous group of students, marginaling instead of marginalizing instead of centering difference. The bill constructs education as an individual and individualistic endeavor, with students having no responsibility to or relation with the political and social functions of education. Subjectification. Through mechanisms of compliance, control, and standardization, there seems to be little space for students to be and become in relation to themselves to others or to the world. Individual achievement is valued above all else and then only some achievement will matter. And as I mentioned earlier, that achievement might have to come at the cost to one's identity. A sweeping new education bill, if designed by progressive leaders, educators and educational researchers would aim to reflect our current day society, its richness, its complexity. It would acknowledge our current understandings of children as agentic and contributors to this world and as wildly different in their gifts and interests. At the very least, a current day approach to education would surely include meaningful references and if not policies about anti-racism, decolonization, eco-justice, and an ethical orientation towards inclusion. Bill 64, the Education Modernization Act, is far from modern, if by that we mean reflective of contemporary understandings of children and education. But it is indeed what we would call modernist, that is, it in, in its inability to comprehend and accommodate human diversity, complexity, and contingency. We must do better to create more truthful narratives in our education system narratives that honor our past and our present and all of those on this land that we now call Canada. 
Thank you. Over to you, Mark. Oh man, uh, I am uh, very impressed. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Jansen. Um, you should know that that uh, we actually live about two blocks away from each other, and uh, I plan to uh, be by once we're allowed um, to do that for uh, not only uh, lessons in uh, brilliant words like agentic and um, but also for some PowerPoint lessons, because everyone will see that I am, I am woefully inadequate on that level. Uh, but th th that was beautiful, and uh, I'm very, um, I'm energized uh, by that analysis. Um, I want to say I'm, I'm absolutely honored to be part of this, uh, this process, to be invited to it, and to share space here um, with uh, Candy and Melanie and uh, Leslie. Um, and I'll do my best to offer um, some something of, of value to what I think is a, a really, really important topic. Um, and by looking at the many participants, uh, I can tell that I'm not alone in feeling this. In fact, I don't know that there's been a time in my 20 odd years or so of being involved in education in Manitoba where there has been more attention and more concern about the system. And so um, despite the dim things that I'm going to share in the next little bit, um, I think there's reason to take heart uh, in that. Um, thanks, Laura. So when I come, uh, when I came to, to this, this task of, of analyzing uh, Bill 64 and providing a research uh, response or, or research-based response, um, I I kind of felt like a kid uh, when my parents uh, used to take us across the border to shop, uh, which I'm sure my mom's probably on the call and is cringing at the fact that this is such a big memory. It was the first time I ever went to a buffet. I think we went to the Royal Fork Buffet. And I, I remember walking up and just seeing miles and miles of food, or so it seemed to a guy who was about yay tall, and not knowing where to start. And that's how I felt when I came to the, this task, is, you know, where do you start with this omnibus bill? Um, that proposes such sweeping changes to this system. Um, and so I, I kind of dialed myself back and I asked myself a more foundational question, which is, what, why, am I, why am I upset about this? Um, after all, I've spent most of my career criticizing schools. Um, even when I was teaching it at, at Gordon Bell and, and was part and parcel of the problems I was criticizing, I, I am a thoroughgoing critic of schools. I spent the last four years of my life um, uh, completing a dissertation that looks at the, the staggering structural inequities uh, that, that um, create a lack of opportunity for Indigenous youth in schools. Um, so why am I upset about this? Uh, and it comes down to this, and so I'll, 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 I'm only going to share a few slides. Um, but, but at the root, the theme of, of my dissent um, is based on this reality, um, you know, articulated by Martin Buber uh, after the Second World War, when the whole world started asking questions um, about, you know, how, how could this have happened? Um, and a lot of th their attention was turned towards schools and education. And, and, and Martin Buber said that trust in the world, because this human exists, that's the most inward achievement in the relation in education. Because this human exists, uh, meaninglessness, however hard pressed you are by it, uh, can't be the real truth because this human being exists in the darkness, the light lies hidden in fear, salvation and callousness of one's fellow men, uh, the great love. My uh, response to Bill 64 is rooted in issues of trust. Trust is the currency of schooling. Herbert Cole said years ago that all learning happens at the ascent of learners. And in order to achieve that ascent, trust has to be fostered. Um, so then I, I looked at the premises of the bill and I started to ask myself, if I'm opposed to this, you know, what, why is that? What, wh what's the root of that opposition? Um, and like a buffet, I just picked the, some of my favorite topics here. Um, but there are four things that make me 
feel like even though uh, the bill proposes to address a lack of engagement and achievement in Manitoba, and I, I think that there is a lack of engagement, and I think that we can go a long way to improve certain kinds of achievement in Manitoba, um, why do I disagree with it? And, and there's four things. First is this, um, in framing this bill, a massive uh, ed review was undertaken. And I saw teachers and parents uh, in my family and in my uh, extended network of colleagues, uh, despite their sense of hesitancy, take the government at its word and go out and tell their truth um, in exhaustive rounds of consultation. Um, and they took their, they really did go and speak their words. And, and I attended many of the sessions and in the sessions I heard predominant themes or concerns about equity, inclusion, indigenizing the curriculum, indigenizing uh, schools for indigenous youth and non-indigenous youth, tackling the, the real question of reconciliation about the plague of childhood poverty, a lack of resources and feeling like schools were all alone in the effort to try to address those things. I heard those words and so did the commissioners. Um, and that's clear in the recommendations that they made. I don't agree with all the recommendations, um, but I do know that the least commented on topic in all of those uh, <laughs> consultations was the issue of governance. I also know the recommendation on governance is nowhere near what Bill 64 looks like. And I actually have to shout out to Rick Lees, uh, one of the commissioners who spoke out and said, this isn't what we said. This isn't what we said. We didn't propose 15 regions with these education authorities and uh, propose um, getting rid of trustees. So uh, I, I see the framers of this bill as having asked but not listened. Um, I also see them as looking but not seeing in their report, their best strategy, they indicated uh, the top 10 lessons from COVID. Um, and they said one of them was that we have a resilient system and, I, and my the hair went up on the back of my neck. Whenever I hear people say somebody is resilient or something is resilient, I take a pause and I think we all should because uh, while it's important to recognize um, the incredible efforts that schools undertook and their relative success over this last year and a bit of COVID, um, there's something um, immoral about looking at how hard some a group of people has worked and then saying their ability to do that, to sustain this, the, this level of stress, good on them. Now we know what they can do. There's something wrong about seeing somebody suffering and marveling at their ability to handle the suffering without saying, now let's alleviate the causes of it. Um, so uh, they look, but they don't see. They also draw illogical conclusions in framing this bill. I agree, and I think everyone in the province agrees uh, that there's a problem with uh, acclimation of trustees, that, that, that we would like to have more, pub more public participation in those processes. Um, but the bill's propo proposed solution to the issue of engagement uh, isn't to look at the actual problem and address it, it's to blow up the whole system and instead replace trustees, which literally they have the word trust in their title, um, with school councils and an uh, arm's length far off organization. Um, and then to say that schools will have to conduct elections every year for their school council and then those councils will have to conduct elections uh, to send individual representatives up to the to the big high authority. Um, it, this is a lot like if you get a flat tire blowing up your car. Uh, if the problem is actually with engagement, why not address that? Um, and then finally, there's unclear promises. Um, you know, there's $40 million in resources apparently uh, alleviated from this, but no indication of what those resources will be directed into, except I have a hint that when I got my check from the government saying, you know, here's your property tax, re education property tax rebate, I guess I'm supposed to bring that to a classroom. So uh, those are the reasons I don't trust the premise. So then I ask myself, if I don't trust your premise, that's why I, I, I feel reticence towards this bill. Not because I disagree that there's a problem of engagement, but if I disagree, if I don't trust the premises that you're using, uh, to frame it, I have to ask, who do you think we are and what do you think the problem is? 
because the problem as you framed it is doesn't seem to be what you're addressing. Um, and so then I just chose four things from the um, four choices the government's made in framing this bill that I think reveal a lot about who they see us in education are. And, and I hope that my teaching colleagues in, in the my, my public school teaching colleagues in, in the chat uh, still allow me some some uh, membership in that club. I know it's it's been six years since I was a full time teacher, but um, everything I do now is still based on what I learned in those classrooms. <laughs> so uh, here here's where I think uh, we can identify some of the assumptions that this bill holds about the nature of teaching, learning and, and of schools. And, and we start with them choosing the problem of underachievement. So, okay, we've got a problem with underachievement. We've, we've been lagging behind on, on these tests that we're supposed to accept as uh, objective measures. I think Candy's gonna talk a bit about that. Um, the response to the underachievement was to establish a structure of governance. Um, which tells me that the government's assumption about solving this problem is to enforce control. Um, so that's priority one, control. Uh, the second priority that I think here is um, in not just in the choice to, to choose governance as the priority, but the structure of that governance. So the structure of that governance is far less messy than what we have now. Right. No, no one who's attended a school board meeting um, would argue that they are models of efficiency. Right. That's because they're models of democracy um, and democracy is necessarily messy. It's because it's the commingling of, of people who have different opinions trying to come to a consensus. That's very, very challenging um, and, and it's not an efficient system. So what they proposed is a system with a. Uh, a large structure with a, invested with a lot of authority that's largely appointed at the top of the structure and then small, rather ineffectual councils at the bottom um, that should that we've been assured can still maintain their focus on fundraising. Now, that's a direct quote uh, from one of the <laughs> from one of the sessions I attended. Um, so what does that tell me? The other priority is efficiency. So we've got control, we've got efficiency. The choice to separate principals from teachers. Uh, in terms of their professional organization, uh, shows another thing, another priority of this of this bill. Um, the rationale for doing it is uh, to avoid the potential conflict of interest that exists between a principal and a teacher being in a union uh, together. The only time that conflict of interest, perceived or real, could affect could happen, is in an issue of around discipline. So that tells me that by making that choice, another priority of this bill is surveillance, because that's the focus that they see principals as school leaders as taking on. Um, I would argue also that that by separating teachers from principals from teachers, you remove principals who, whom I love uh, from the source of their greatest strength, which is classroom life. Um, and then finally, another priority, the, pro the language that's used around student learning throughout the documentation around Bill 64 is performance. It's not learning. It's not achievement. It is performance. Um, that's a good point, Randy. There are conflict of interests that exist because of familial relations. Um, so, uh, and then performance, the goal of that performance is reduced to performing on two, uh, two areas, literacy and numeracy. Uh, those become the, the two goalposts of, of our educational system. So what that tells me is, I'm going to share my screen with my woefully inadequate PowerPoint slides. Uh, tells me this. If your priorities are control, efficiency, surveillance, and performance, and these are the priorities you're enacting in order to address the problem of underachievement in the schools, then that must mean you see us in schools as being out of control, inefficient, suspicious, and observant. Those are just antonyms of the other things. Uh, there's no real great antonym for performance, but the, anti but the antonym for performer is observer. So from performance to observant. And this might surprise uh, everybody here who knows me, but I largely agree with that assessment of schools. 
uh, and teaching. Of, uh, sorry, not of schools, but of teaching. I think that teaching is largely uh, perceived or can be seen from the outside as out of control. It can be inefficient. It can be suspicious. And teachers are definitely suspicious. That's because they're critical thinkers. And the primary tool that teachers use to develop pedagogical action is observation. Um, I disagree with the direction that this bill goes in, but I kind of agree with these conclusions uh, in, a, in a perhaps an ironic way. Um, and just to give you a sense of this notion of out of control, the reason why teaching may, may seem from the outside, it, despite the desire of Bill 64 to create a linear input-output model that's easily measurable and attainable, is it just doesn't respond to the very re real experience of teachers in schools, um, which uh, Max Van Manen from the University of Alberta articulates beautifully here. So pardon me for the long slide. In the daily life of teaching children, teachers often feel that they're constantly on the spot and in the spur of, mo of the moment, only limited deliberative reflection seems possible. When the teacher is live, then 30 some pairs of eyes may be registering his or her every move. Uh, mood and move. This quality of engaged immediacy can, certainly seems to be a main factor that contributes to the common phenomenon of teacher fatigue and enervation. We should not underestimate the complexity of this immediate situatedness of teaching as practical action. Life in classrooms is contingent, dynamic, ever-changing. Every moment, every second is situation specific. Moments of teaching are on fire instant actions. And that to me is where, uh, you know, the sense of, of this is the thing that Bill 64 misses uh, on, on top of um, all of the other uh, things that Melanie has pointed out and that Candy will, will be speaking uh, to shortly. Classrooms are necessarily messy environments, just like school board meetings. They're human places where people are commingled together uh, who have different stories and they come together to craft a common story. Um, and while I'm sure that there'd be some people who would be uh, listening to this saying, yeah, but Mark, what about, you know, the, the, the daily rigor of lesson plans and, and assessment and, and having a planned model. I'm not saying that there is an order in all of this chaos. I'm saying that the teacher's particular skill set is to find order in while embracing that chaos. Because all learning happens at the ascent of learners and because learners are diverse, as Melanie has pointed out, um, a teacher's particular craft requires tremendous autonomy and it requires trust. So I would suggest that were this bill to be revised, and I, I, I maintain hope that there will be fundamental revisions, um, that it be revised to, to be built upon the premises of, of classroom reality as opposed to the fixations of, of the government in power. Uh, and I think actually if, they, if the government would release the actual consultation documents as opposed to their summary of it, we would find that there's actually rich data there uh, to support the restructuring of this bill into, it, into a thing that does actually address some of the real challenges that we have in Manitoba that underpin achievement, so-called achievement issues, things like generational poverty, um, things like the historical and contemporary ongoing um, dispossession of Indigenous learners, the fastest growing portion of our population from school success, um, and also um, from from a lack of public engagement. I think those things can be addressed and I think that we have those skills within our community. Here's the thing, the currency of education is trust. The premises of this bill are based on untrustworthy assumptions and practices and the effect of the bill will be to delimit the autonomy and the uh, autonomous spaces within schools where trust can be fostered and society can be renewed, which is after all, always been the purpose of having public schools. So uh, I'm honored to be uh, here in this company and uh, in, with, with my co-presenters, but also with all of you out there uh, listening. Uh, um, we absolutely um, are in this together and I look forward to seeing all of you in the committee room uh, talking um, 
about your ideas and sharing your passion for this really, really precious public trust. So thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Um, you'll let me know if I, if you can't anyway. Um, as already mentioned, I'm Candy Skyhar. I work in the Department of Curriculum and Pedagogy in the Faculty of Education at Brandon University. I'm honored to be part of this discussion and thank the organizers at U of M and U of W for the invitation to speak with you tonight. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm presenting from Treaty 2 territory. Treaty 2 was entered into on August 21st, 1871, almost 50 years ago. Treaty 2 is home to the Dakota, Anishinaabek, Oji Cree, Cree, Dene, and Métis peoples. Brennan University also has a campus on Treaty 1 territory. Today, uh, like many, I'm saddened and outraged by the most recent discovery of the remains of 751 individuals in the Maryville Indian Residential School. I recognize that this will not be the last discovery about the truth of Canada's dark past and the loss of children who were deeply loved by their families and communities. My presentation tonight is titled Conceptualizations of Mathematics Achievement in Rural Communities in Bill, Six, uh, Bill 64. And it will, as the title suggests, look at Bill 64 through two distinct lenses. Um, its focus on mathematics and numeracy achievement as discussed in the bill and the bill's potential impacts on rural communities. Just to give you a bit of background about myself, prior to coming to BU six years ago, I taught at three different rural and remote Manitoba communities, Snow Lake, Carberry and McGregor. I taught primarily high school beginning as an ELA teacher and moving into mathematics about five years into my 20 year career. My doctoral research was focused on the development of a rural professional development model for teachers and focused on improving numeracy outcomes. Since coming to BU, where I was hired primarily to teach mathematics curriculum and pedagogy courses, my interests have continued to follow issues related to rural education. As such, it is with these two lenses that I'll share my thoughts about Bill 64 with you tonight. So I'll start with a quick reminder about the proposed K-12 system for those who may not have looked that closely at it or who haven't seen it recently. In the plan, the existing 37 school divisions will be amalgamated to create 15 regions or also called RCAs. Existing school boards will be eliminated with the exception of the Francophone division, the DSFM. Each region will have an appointed director of education, which would be similar to an existing superintendent or CEO. The proposed system would be headed by the Minister of Education, who ha would have an advisory council, the acronym for this is PACE or PACE, comprised of 16 members, one parent advisory, uh, sorry, one parent representative from each region, elected from among the school community council executives and one trustee representative from the DSFM. The Provincial Educational Authority, the acronym for this is PEA, it will be, as its Orwellian name suggests, a new government agency in charge of education in the 15 regions. If implemented, it'll feature, uh, or it would feature six to 11 person cabinet appointed board with a minimum of two parents selected from the advisory council. Uh, school community councils with an acronym SCC will replace existing parent advisory councils and one SCC member from each region will serve on PACE as mentioned and a minimum of two will be on the PEA. So as I said, um, 37 divisions would become 15 regions plus the DSFM in the proposed plan, not even in mentioning uh, that 55 to 60, I think it's actually 57% of the students in Manitoba and Winnipeg, which is only one region with one voice. I have significant concerns about the geography of the rural regions in the proposal. First of all, the size of the regions is tremendous. For example, Prairie Rose and Prairie Spirit together as one region would cover 9,515 square kilometers. Beautiful Plains, Park West and Rolling River would cover an area east of Nipua all the way to the Saskatchewan border. 
Park West uh, School Division office in Bertel is 124 to 154 kilometers from beautiful Plains School Division in Nipua, depending on the route. Imagine engaging in regional PD in this proposed RCA. One volunteer parent, and I emphasize volunteer, would represent each region. So are the interests and needs in Bertel the same as in Nipua? What would the impact of a parent from one community be on what is represented in the centralized educational body? Relying on representation from volunteers is also problematic. In small rural communities, the same people are taxed by volunteer demands. In addition to careers and personal lives, representing a nearly 10,000 square kilometer region is a ridiculous request of a volunteer position in my opinion. trying to get it to move. <laughs> uh, in terms of the proposed funding model, uh, much of which is yet to be determined, I also have several thoughts. With the elimination of 36 school boards, educational taxes will not be set locally. Rather, the PEA will set mill rates in the province and let municipalities know how much should be raised by special levy in each region. There is a plan to allow for a 10-year transition before making regional mill rates consistent. Inconsistency was clearly something that was a bone of contention at some level. While I agree that the funding model for education needed changing, I'm perplexed by this move. I thought we would see a complete removal of education taxes from property and a centralization of tax dollars through provincial income tax. This would have resulted in a loss of local voice for sure. However, the proposed model, despite keeping taxes calculated regionally, still nets a loss of local voice. Rural regions with much higher transportation costs will, are, will be required to raise through regional mill rates their own portion of educational costs. It seems to me that while they will have no say in how money is spent, they will potentially bear the burden of the higher transportation costs that will be involved in the creation of larger regions. The loss of local voice, voice regarding taxation has been referred to as taxation without representation of late in several places, including an open letter to parents by Prairie Spirit School Board. I have seen the existing model play out in several scenarios. I have seen a division fund a numeracy specialist through local levy dollars. I have seen local boards fund sports for students and communities to ensure all children have the right to play. I wonder what it will mean for rural communities when the PEA sets the rates and controls from Winnipeg how money is spent in rural places. I worry that this is, in effect, a silencing of rural voices and a disavowal of local knowledge in rural communities. In addition to the funding model, another thing to consider in Bill 64 is the fact that, that the property of school divisions will be transferred to the PEA, including schools. So will the rights and responsibilities for upkeep and, sorry, the rights to dispense of properties. The bill recognizes, quote, schools, school facilities are community resources and are shared in accordance with the authority board's community use policy, end quote. I find this a bit worrisome. Local community control of school use, for example, brownies or 4-H or youth groups or community sports, will be determined by the provincial authority policy. Schools are the lifeblood of many communities. The buildings are important local resources. Such a centralization of control of these resources will have detrimental effects on rural communities and the people who inhabit them. In terms of administration, um, I also have several concerns. Principals will be appointed by the PEA for each school. This centralization of control is worrisome. Knowledge about local communities is important for administrators to have. Will this deter teachers from working their way into administrative positions? How will this affect recruitment and retention in rural communities, something that has long been cited as an issue in the literature? Principals being moved out of the collective agreement process may further affect recruitment and retention. I feel as though principals will be positioned as the exactors of policy rather than instructional leaders in this process. In terms of improving student learning outcomes, I cannot see how this is helpful. Finally, the complete absence of consideration of teaching principals is ominous. Many very small schools do not have full-time principals. It makes me wonder if these schools will in fact cease to be. Another, cons 
Another consideration that has garnered attention is the fact that the Lieutenant Governor will make decisions about transportation, including how long students can be on bus routes. There used to be a 60 minute rule, but that has been superseded by the new legislation or would be superseded by the new legislation. Many rural families concerned about school closures are understandably worried about students being forced to travel to other communities. Students could have to spend longer hours on buses, which could also impact their ability to participate in extracurricular activities, not to mention the additional cost to parents who would have to travel to schools outside of their communities for a variety of events. Another point related to transportation is the effect of the size of new regions. Weather in Bertle may not be the same as weather in Nipawa. Road closures may affect small pockets at a time. Such variances could make transportation difficult to manage. Another impact of centralized decision making could be the impact on local rural businesses. Budgeting and purchasing decisions will no longer be made at the local level if this bill is passed. This will most definitely have an impact on local businesses that have historically provided services to schools and divisions, further putting in jeopardy community sustainability. School closures are written into Bill 64, despite Minister Cullen's educational update on the 14th of June, in which he said there was no mandate to close schools and that any school closure procedures would still include public, public consultation. I find it incredibly concerning that only one of the criteria needs to be met to close a school. So if schools are consolidated or the PEA determines enrollment is too low, they can be closed. Moreover, this decision will be made in Winnipeg with little understanding of local context. Of all the concerns relating to rural communities, teachers and students, I believe that the threat of school closures and the potential resulting impact on communities is the greatest. Others have written about this. I think of Jacqueline and Eskew's article about the impact of closing a school in Limerick, Saskatchewan, for example. Such closures have the potential to negatively impact the lives of all residents in a community. I believe that students, teachers, families, and community members should be concerned about potential school closures in addition to the many other considerations I have raised thus far. If you will forgive the abrupt change in topic, um, I would like to also speak to the, to the focus on mathematics or numeracy outcomes in the CAVE 12 report and Bill 64. This is the other hat I have worn for 25 years and I noticed several things in these two documents. I will point out that you should take note of this abrupt change as well. If the goal of educational revitalization or modernization, as the bill puts it, is to improve student learning outcomes, it is, a note, it is noteworthy that my switch from consideration of the impact on rural communities and students is noticeably abrupt. It begs the question, what does creating regions have to do with improving student learning? This is perhaps a question on which an entire webcast could be spent. The first thing I noticed in both the report and the bill is that they begin from a negative or deficit stance. The very first point in the research summary on numeracy is declining math performance, followed by a brief reference to PISA and PCAP scores. So let's look at the PISA and PCAP scores. A lot of weight has been put on the PISA, which stands for the Program for International Student Assessment and PCAP, which stands for Pan-Canadian Assessment Program. So it's essentially international and national testing. Manitoba ranked last on both the 2016 PCAP and 2018 PISA test among the provinces. This is true as you can see with the red circles. You probably saw headlines in the newspaper to this effect. The reasons, however, are extremely complex. First of all, the two tests are very different in terms of the questions asked. The PISA test focuses more on rational thinking and mathematical scenarios and problems. They are really not comparable tests and they are set by external bodies who do not know Manitoba students or Manitoba curricula necessarily. Secondly, what is often not mentioned is that public and provincially funded students take part. The Manitoba results do not include federally funded schools in Indigenous communities. I find this incredibly troublesome. Third, provinces and communities with generally higher socioeconomic status perform better on these tests. We know that Manitoba has a very high child poverty rate. There is little in Bill 64 to address systemic issues of poverty that hold back students in all areas, including mathematics achievement. 
Do we need to improve? Clearly. But what I don't see in the documents is a concrete plan to do this. Another thing that stood out to me in the K-12 report was the way it looked to other provinces rather than research and experience for solutions. The first reference had to do with PEI's improved numeracy performance. If I go back a slide, you'll notice that in 2018, um, Prince Edward Island actually dropped again from 499 to 487. And going back to where I was, I'll call your attention to the last line underlined in red. The Numeracy Achievement Project, NAP for short run by the MRLC, has had tremendous success in Manitoba schools. One line attributing this project to PEI's success minimizes this local rural experience and success in the document. And so the minimization of local and research-based expertise is troublesome in my opinion in both the report and the bill. A final example to this effect is the description of Ontario's math strategy in the report. Again, the report looks at a four-year initiative only begun in 2018 that has yet to provide data about the initiative's success due to the early stages of the strategy. I find myself wondering why this is the example to which the report refers. You can draw your own conclusions when you look at what is described here. Perhaps we are to follow the steps Ontario has taken, whether they are successful or not. To be clear, what I expected to see in the research on mathematics edu education, for example, um, was research on mathematics education. For example, work like that of Hunter, who speaks about achievement and accountability in comments like the one you see on this slide, uh, would be something I would expect to see in an educational report. Hunter says mathematics education scholars argue that high quality mathematics instruction teaches for conceptual understanding, provides students with cognitively demanding tasks requiring problem solving, engages students in collaborative work, expects students to justify their thinking and critique the reasoning of others in whole class discussions and focuses on problem solving. He goes on to say research positively links instruction exhibiting these qualities to higher student achievement. Instead of seeing comments like this from the research, what we end up seeing oops, are recommendations about grade level expectations, about standardized algorithms, about math fact recall and accountability through curriculum based tests at grade three or four, six or seven and 10. And how will we know if we've met our goal? According to the best strategy, we will be the most improved province on PCAP and PISA scores. All of our students will have improved scores, all of them. And we will have closed the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous students, even though many Indigenous students don't write the national and international tests. So one of the questions I was asked to consider is what research on students, teachers and learning needs to be considered and why. In my opinion, literature related to the effects of centralization of educational control, amalgamations, and rural communities should have been consulted and should still be consulted. So should literature on rural place-based and Indigenous ways of knowing, and I think of Woodhouse and Knapp, for example, some of their work. Literature on improving student literacy and numeracy outcomes. Literature about poverty and socioeconomic status and learning, like the work of Baird. And if I bring the two topics together, I think it's important to consider the work of authors like Howley, Showalter, Klein, Sturgill and Smith, who, who speak about the need to develop more responsive mathematics instruction in rural contexts that values rural and place-based ways of knowing and works against dominant forces that would educate rural students out of rural communities. This vein of work seeks to embrace rural contexts as strengths, not deficiencies, meaningful in their own right as being uh, as wor worthy of being stewards of. For those of you who didn't see it, uh, on June 14th, Minister Cullen provided an educational update. I won't read his comments, but I was deeply concerned about the underlying messages in the address. I felt that the messages passed on were that parents and teachers are incapable of reading the bill or understanding when they are being misled. That the MTS leadership is separate from frontline teachers. 
Teachers are positioned as unwitting victims of the union's misinformation campaign, us, is, us versus them, union busting rhetoric, delegitimizing the professionalism and intelligence of Manitoba teachers. I felt the message was that those speaking out who were referred to as a vocal minority are somehow not interested in improving educational outcomes and that Manitobans are not getting their money's worth. I have and will continue to examine the K-12 report and Bill 64 using the lenses through which I have experience and expertise. I have registered to speak from the, these experiences to the Bill 64 Legislative Committee and will remind you that you are welcome to do the same by calling the office of the clerk. My suspicion is that there, are more, that there will be more than a vocal minority that will show up to share their thoughts with the committee. Please join me in thanking our speakers this evening for their compelling presentations. Thank you, Dr. Jansen, Dr. Cooley, and Dr. Skyhar. Thank you so much. We have a few moments remaining, and we will address a few of the questions that have been placed in the Q&A. If we don't get to your question, please know that we're recording all of the uh, documented questions in our Q&A with the hopes of addressing them or related themes in future webinars. I generally don't address a question if it comes from an anonymous attendee. I would much rather that someone places their name in the Q&A before we address their question. However, there were a couple of excellent questions that I wanted to uh, bring up with our panelists this evening because there was one common theme and that was around uh, what are some of the revisions that might need to be made to Bill 64 to make it acceptable and then there's a bit of a flip side on that and that was around might Bill 64 just need to be tossed out. So there were a couple of those possibilities. Uh, so I'm, I'm interested to hear from each of our panelists their thoughts on next steps and moving forward related to Bill 64. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, I, yeah, I feel bad that I I, I, uh, I thought I was being radical and saying this needed to be revised. Yeah, sure, we we can uh, we, <laughs> we 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 can toss it out. But uh, to to be serious, I think that um, I think that to be honest about what what is actually trying to be addressed, and then actually look at real responses to the problems that that are there. So to me, there, there's there's good reason to think that a level of engagement. Um, as it stands right now needs to be improved. Um, so I, one thing I would say is, is you take all the resources that you imagine you're gonna dedicate, or that I imagine you have to dedicate to building all of these councils and elections and take those resources and uh, use them to stimulate public um, uh, engagement in, in school boards. Uh, and and in actual ele in elections, whereby uh, you know maybe there's school-based elections for school boards. That, it, that that seems to be easy. And then on on the level of of math and, and literacy um, scores, at some point we have to have the guts in this province to say that we know how averages are formed. Averages are formed when you put together all of the scores, and then you divide by the number of scores, right? So what we have in Manitoba, and this is absolutely clear, um, is not a case of all Manitoban students achieving at whatever the number the PCAP or the PISA score says. What we have is a big chunk of students in Manitoba, those represented by our 80 or 90% graduation rates in four years, scoring at incredibly high rates, and a big chunk of students who are absolutely not even showing up on the radar on those tests. And those students, and this is where we have to have the moral courage to be able to say, we know what those students need. 
They need curriculum that the, that the TRC calls to action ask for, uh, that represent their experiences, that acknowledge the incredible, incredible um, disenfranchisement that exists between the school system and indigenous communities. We need policies like allowing teachers to certify as EAL uh, teachers. You can't get a minor in teaching English as an additional language when we have a booming newcomer population and we have indigenous students who need literacy instruction uh, at, that, at that sort of like language acquisition level. So let's not go beating everybody up with PISA scores. Let's actually look at what is, is at the root of them and then put the resources in place to actually address them. Like the, it, this is just, you don't even need a bill for that. You just need some courage. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. I, I, I'll follow that up because I agree. I, I don't think the bill addresses anything that has been identified as a problem in the current education system. Um, and I would go as far as to say that there is nothing salvageable in this bill. Um, the governance model is absolutely um, puts all of the power into appointed officials of the government. And let's keep in mind, that'll be government of the day. So whoever's in charge is, is reappointing whoever they want um, and driving the, the focus of the educational priorities. Um, and, and the curriculum or the lack thereof uh, is, is totally reflective of 100 years ago. Um, we actually had a PhD student, Rebecca Herringer, who I think is on the call tonight, who did an analysis of this, comparing the language of this bill to what curriculum theorists used 100 years ago. Um, so, you know, I don't see that there's a lot here to salvage. I think, Candy, the points that you made tonight were excellent. I think, Mark, your um, analysis of the, the emphasis on performance and not learning, um, I, I think is detrimental to, to everybody. I don't see anything salvageable in this bill. Um, and it would be my hope that, as Candy suggested, there is an outpouring of protest through the legislative bill committee process and that the that this silent or sorry, that this vocal minority, um, you know, continues to create dissent and problems for the minister until somebody in the government, you know, starts to pay attention and feels threatened um, enough that they'll take that they, and I mean threatened in their electoral status, um, that they feel threatened enough to take, to take the dissent seriously. I would agree to, uh, uh with those points as well, Melanie. Um, one thing I would add, and one thing that I didn't say um, is I'm, I'm not sure about other, uh, my experience has been that participation in parent advisory council has been woefully inadequate. So I almost started laughing when they said they were gonna have elections to figure out who to send on to the next uh, level because I thought, wow. Um, and there, I also noticed right away that there is no voice for teachers. Um, the people who have educational expertise are not listened to in this particular model. That's why I think it needs to be scrapped. I think not only are there issues related to uh, pitting rural versus urban divisions against each other, I think that, um, I think that everyone needs to stand up and just say, um, this is not acceptable. This is not the way that we should be moving forward. It's a complete step backwards. Okay, I, I want to clarify. I am in favor of throwing the bill out. <laughs> I, for all those reasons and more. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification, Mark, and thanks to the panelists for, for their informative answers. Uh, there's a quotation from Martin Buber, uh, thanks to Mark for bringing that forward. And uh, the quotation is, all journeys have secret destinations of which the traveler is unaware. It just hits a little too close to home for me right now. So thanks for bringing that uh, forward. The second uh, bank of questions that I wanted to address just continues on with the theme of test scores, because I think we did a, a great job of having a discussion about test scores and the reason why Manitoba students are performing the way that they are. Uh, and, and thank you for addressing that in the panel. However, I wanted to move a step forward from that. And that is uh, a question to all of you in regard to 
the purpose of education. And certainly for me, it moves beyond the test score because a good teacher and a solid education is so much more than the score that you get on the test at the end of the day. Those scores are important, but they're not everything and they're not the reason why we educate students. And I'd like to just throw that out to the panel and I'd like to get your thoughts. I, I can respond first if you like. Um, yeah, um, I, <laughs> I have mixed feelings about um, the national and international tests as well as the provincial tests that um, I've been involved with in, in math. And I think there's a uh, there's value in knowing um, sort of patterns uh, in mathematics learning in the province. There's there's some power in that. And whether or not those those particular tests are actually giving us valuable information is maybe debatable, but um, there is some value in that. Um, the PISA uh, test, I actually don't have a lot of issue with. I've looked at the questions and I think it's actually quite logical. Um, however, um, I would take a student who has the ability to, to engage in critical thinking, um, who's a good citizen, um, and who can um, sort of think and problem solve any day over somebody who has a specific piece of information that might be in a math curriculum somewhere. So um, I will, uh, will add to what I've already said about the PISA and PCAP scores by adding that you're, you're absolutely right in that way. Um, the social implications like uh, Melanie was speaking about at the beginning, um, the socialization, it's not here, it's not in this bill. Um, and it is probably one of the things that most people would say is the most important part of, of a public education. I'll go real quick. Um, around the purpose of schools, there's always been, and there, and there should, I think, always be some tension. Um, around the question of what are schools for. I think that that's something that every generation, every year and every class has to kind of come to some new and evolving answer to because education is always couched in the context of society. The conversations we're having today have are, are united to conversations we had 15 years ago by that, that thread, that thread of like, how do we respond to what's going on around us? Um, so I, I think that there should be attention uh, and an ongoing uh, discussion around that. That's that's why this this bill concerns me. It's not just the um, it's it's not just it's so such clear focus on two indicators of what success looks like literacy and numeracy. It's also the removal of some of the really trusted methods that we have for continuing to have discussions, the checks and balances within the system. I didn't talk about that in, in my uh, session, but that, that's what's really concerning. That's another thing that's really concerning about it. Uh, on, the, on the level of, of this PCAP thing, I think we set up a false opposition between rigor and, and social learning. Uh, rigorous academic learning and social learning. Kieran Egan uh, out, of, um, out of the West Coast, he has a beautiful piece in his teaching about sto teaching a storytelling where he says people forget when these literacy debates why we invented reading. We, we invented reading to, to, to talk to each other, right? Like we, we it has a context, otherwise it's useless. Um, and the same thing for math, it's there to solve problems. So what are the problems and what are the tools we need? So anyway. I would just add to that, that the, um, I think that um, the perseveration on international test scores, although Candy points out that they can be useful for measuring certain things in certain populations, we also know that they're largely determined by socioeconomic status. But the communities or the media's perseveration on that is a total distraction 
um, from what education actually is about and the things that have been raised by the panelists tonight. Um, when we think about what we want for our own children, for our neighbors' kids, for our family members, it has nothing to do with, with what's on a PISA test score. It's how they are and who they are in the world um, and in relation to others around them. Um, this is stuff that you can't measure, but this is surely the stuff that happens in schools every day, um, as my colleagues well know who are educators. Um, uh, you know, I, so I, yeah, I'll just go back to that. I think the international test score is an absolute distraction from what really needs to happen. And that is to address poverty and inequity that we have in our schools, the constant defunding and underfunding that you know is is now easy for the government to say well look we have a we have a problem well yeah let's look at the real problem is the defunding of schools that has happened for decades um, under left and right governments that detract from schools ability to do the work that they're designed to do and unless we stop start talking about what that is and stop talking about saving money constantly i don't think we're ever going to get to the heart of the issue on the level of accountability um, what the big question is like, because there's going to be a bunch of tests run out through this bill, right? They're going to propose a bunch of tests. Um, just notice how the premier responds when accountability measures are brought up to him. No, because people will say that the people in the system are trying to skirt the blame, right? We're trying to, oh my God. But watch how quickly the premier moves to try and explain away things like COVID death rates in Manitoba. We have to face these numbers, but actually use real understanding of where they're coming from, right? I don't know any teacher who's not in favor of great learning and great acts, great, great outcomes for students. Um, it's just, I agree with Melanie, this is this is a hammer as opposed to, uh, to an offer of help. On that note, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the panel this evening for an absolutely uh, wonderful session and great presentations and uh, wonderful responses to our Q&A. I would also like to conclude, so I will be sharing a slide here just to conclude our presentation. And I'd like to just draw your attention to the fact that we will be having a bit of a break, not that much of a break yet. <laughs> there we go. Having a bit of a break for uh, next Thursday. So we won't be meeting by webinar next Thursday on July the 1st, but we will reconvene on July the 8th at 7 p.m. to discuss the proposal uh, the proposed education reform, specifically part four entitled Connecting with All Learners and Two Learners. And finally, I would like to uh, thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Jansen, Dr. Uh, Cooley, and Dr. Skyhar. And I would like to thank all of you for spending time on this lovely summer evening and hopefully you'll be able to get out a bit to enjoy uh, a few warm moments of daylight uh, today. So we look forward to seeing you again on July the 8th. And until then, I wish you well. Have a great evening.